Hmm? Just... <clears throat> Hi, Captain. Sorry I had to call you in on a Sunday, but I thought it was really important you view the latest surveillance and tape on Caputo. Okay. But you know the drill. Just give me the material and I'll take them down and review them on my own. I don't want to hear your opinion until after I review them. And Mancuso, why are you here? You got nothing else better to do on a Sunday? I called Ralph and Captain. I thought you might want to meet with him after you view the tape. Sure, I will. This must be good. I thought Roper was calling me down here for a little fun. Man, is that woman something. But this is all cop here. Why else would she call Mancuso in here? Anyway, this computer investigation is the worst piece of shit Panetti ever left me. And that jerk left me with a lot. That guy never accomplished a damn thing when he was boss. But like the inspector said, the NYPD completes all investigations. Computo. What a joke that is. Panetti said it was common knowledge that Computo Carding Company existed only by strong army businesses and intimidation. Bullshit. Four months of investigation. God knows how many man hours and ten surveillance tapes, and what do we have? We got Computo, he's the frustrated proprietor of a failing garbage business. All he does is complain a lot. Money. The garbage business stinks. His wife is crazy can't get good help. The neighborhood has changed. Doesn't even recognize faces on the street anymore. He hates his competitors and his customers, and his kids don't want no part of his business. Ah, but the food is good at Gino's, but the cooks are not Italian. Shit. But intimidation, strong arming, and organized crime? Give me a major break. Maybe 40 years ago, but now, this shit is just straight up comedy. But still, the NYPD completes all investigations. I see something really good on this tape. I was why would Roper call him Mancuso? Okay. Let's see what we got. That's not Computo. It looks like Computo, but that's not him. They're taping the wrong guys. I'll tell you, Al. Everybody thinks Aguero was hiding something on Flight 709. You see the internet. A bomb, a missile, a secret Navy weapon. It goes on and on. They all think Kallik is hiding something. Forget it. The guy couldn't hide an ice cube in the snow. I mean, if there was anything, anything at all, he'd report it. Hmm. Can you imagine 40, 50 guys hiding something? They didn't find anything. You're right, Dave. They didn't find anything. Maybe there was no evidence to find. It's not to say there was no overt act. I love it, Al. Overt, covert. You just love the old lingo. Well, look, Dave. Let me just give you a few supposes. Okay. Do you remember the big military exercises the Warsaw Pact had back in 83? Well, we monitored them closely to find out what they learned. Anyway, it had always been the agency's thinking that despite the Soviets' big advantages in heavy armor, NATO Air Force would have a huge technological advantage in computers, missiles, radar, weapon systems. We would dominate the battlefield. Of course, Pentagon never agreed and we're always screaming for more of everything. Well, lo and behold, the Soviets had their big war games. And guess what? What? The Soviets came to the same determination as our analysts. They concluded just as we did. NATO would have air supremacy. We would stall their attack, decimate their armor and infantry, counterattack, and force the Soviets into an unfavorable peace, or the use of nuclear weapons. So, 
Well, the point is, the Russians didn't think they could economically or swiftly enough upgrade their air force. Simply put, they couldn't win a war unless NATO air was neutralized. So they decided to collect their cookies, go home, and disband the evil empire. Not quite. The Kremlin wanted to solve the NATO air problem. Did they? Yes. They did? And how? Okay, look. I'm telling you this is background. It's up to you and your buddies at the Bureau to make the connections. It suits you. Okay. The group that came up with the solution was centered at the KGB. Its leader was Andrei Dubov. Dubov? Should I know him? Was he ever in New York? Oh, never been outside of Russia, as far as we know. He's no longer with state security. He still lives in Moscow. Our people tried to talk to him, offered him money and the usual enticements. Forget it. But you figured out what he did and how it works? Yes. Okay, I'm game. What was Dubov's solution? Dubov brought in an East German munition scientist to Moscow. The guy was an expert with microfuses. He developed an altimeter fuse, a very tiny altimeter fuse, a five millimeter sphere. It was designed to go pop at 15,000 feet. Climb a mountain, put it in a balloon, an airplane. The damn thing never failed. One sphere packed with a small amount of C4 plastic explosive goes bang to a temperature of 694 degrees. Easily enough to light jet fuel. Okay, I got it. The KGB develops these explosives. Put one of these spheres in the fuel tank of an F-16 and it explodes when it climbs to 15,000 feet. Uh -huh. The KGB has many covert agents in the West. Some are directed to get jobs at refineries in Europe that make jet fuel or transport companies. Am I right? Go ahead. The agents are trained to introduce the spheres into the fuel supply. When war comes, the jet fuel moves fast. Suddenly, planes begin to explode. NATO has to ground their air forces to find out why. By the time they do, the tanks have already rolled out. Pretty much. The spheres were developed, tested, and manufactured in 1984 and 1985. They pretty much had the same color and specific gravity as jet fuel. This made them virtually invisible to the naked eye. There were two types. One was designed to explode at 15,000 feet. The other was designed to go bang on descent at 2,000 feet. Late in 1985, during the worst in Afghanistan for the Soviets and after Granada, the KGB estimated the probability of war with the West at about 40%. Early in 1986, the spheres were distributed. As far as we know, 24 agents were armed with 5,000 spheres each, but they were never ordered to deploy. Okay. And who were they and where are the spheres? Actually, all were identified. 22 were arrested and the spheres recovered. The other two? The other two. One is dead. The sphere is not recovered. The other? The other vanished off the face of the earth. Again, the spheres were not recovered. Okay, you have at least 10,000 spheres and a guy you can't find. Right. And you're telling me all this not to complete Kalik's report, but because you know a guy must have been here. Yeah. And you want us to find him. Well, yes. Him, the spheres, or whoever he gave them to. Do you have a name? Actually, yes. Peter Delane Dorman. Dorman is the descendant of German settlers into Alsace-Lorraine. His father was a German army physician captured at Stalingrad. He survived the prisoner of war camps in Siberia. His wife was a French-born native of Alsace-Lorraine and his invalid brother were deported by the French after the war. The family eventually settled near Bonn, Germany in 1947. There, Dr. Dorman worked as a physician for the Ministry of Labor. Peter was born in 1952. He grew up hearing rantings and ravings about stupid German bureaucrats, tough Russians, and the bastard French. He became a mechanical engineer 
and was recruited by the KGB in 1978. His last known employer was Kruse Chemica, the big chemical conglomerate in Hamburg, Germany. That's all we know. By the way, this is what we're looking for. So you really did that? You broke up with Phil and actually threw him out? Well, yeah. The guy and the relationship were stale and both were going nowhere. In my office. So, Captain, what did you think? Did you see this man, Cuso? Yes, Captain, I have. All right, Ralph, tell me what you think. Well, Captain, both those guys appear to be feds, and if what they're saying is true, then Flight 709 was no wiring malfunction. Somebody planted those spheres into the central fuel tank, which means the feds will have to reopen their investigation. Well, the feds will have to reopen their investigation. Well, yeah, Captain, this has been a federal investigation from the beginning. What about you, Anita? Now that the NYPD is aware that a horrific crime has been committed on NYC soil, what do you think we should do? Well, Captain, this has been a federal case. I'm just not sure we have a role here. So you think we should just forget about this and let our crack colleagues at the Bureau handle it while we go back to trailing computer? Now look, I know the actions that resulted in the downing of that jet was a federal offense. And I have no doubt that our boys at Federal Plaza will again do their very best. But you tell me how those fears got to Kennedy Airport. They sure as hell didn't fly them over there. Logic says that they used car or truck to transport them through Queens just to get them there. And New York City has strict laws against transporting explosives through New York City streets without the necessary permits. And it's a felony to transport explosives when they could have been used in the execution of a crime. Now need I remind you to that this is a citywide unit and that Queens is still a part of New York City. So I want you two to get started on this right away. I have more faith in our team than the white collar core at Federal Plaza. So we'll meet here tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., okay? Let's get at it. Or need, I need you to stick around for a minute. I need you to come with me to talk to those guys on surveillance they're on stakeout outside of Geno's. They need to take the right people. And the last thing I or the department needs is a lawsuit claiming that we violated someone's rights. Mancuso, I'll see you tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. What? You think I'm gonna forget about this and keep wasting my time with Caputo or whatever stupid investigation that the brass dreams up? This thing is huge. This Dave is Dave D'Alessandro. He's chief of FBI counterintelligence in New York. No. He's made his reputation on those Chinese and Russian spooks at the UN and the consulates. From what I know, he's ran some great stings. But he won't be the one that does this investigation. The FBI may not even reopen the case. But does it, any of this excite you? I thought you loved this stuff. I do, James. Do you think if the feds complain you're on their turf, the brass is gonna cover you? I don't. You leave that up to me. Okay? All right. I gotta get home by seven. That gives us about three hours. Let's get out.